Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. Um, wanted to get a, a information out today on, on, on the next step the Austin Police Department has taken as we work towards clearing up the backlog of the sexual assault cases. Uh, I think that uh, you all are well aware of some of the challenges that we've had in this area over the past year. Uh, a lot of this came to light uh, late last year when we closed our DNA lab uh, due to some of the challenges that we've had there and then that resulted not only in an issue with dealing with backlogged cases but also dealing with uh, the current uh, evidence kits that we're getting in from sexual assault cases. Um, so as a department we've worked very uh, uh, diligently I believe this year with our city council. We have put contracts in place with uh, outside labs so that we can go ahead and process not only our current cases but also our backlogged cases. Uh, we applied for grants uh, for the processing of these cases. We have also dedicated some of our own departmental money towards clearing up the backlog. Again, working towards ensuring that survivors of sexual assaults in this community can see justice in their cases and can see their cases processed in as timely of a manner as possible. So what we've realized now is we've sent out almost 1,500 of these backlogged sexual assault kits for processing and we're now starting to get the results back. We have a sex crimes investigations unit that is already suffering with a very high caseload and to bring in these additional cases uh, that we're now starting to get results on from the backlog and expect that same group to be able to work those, we realized was not going to be uh, handled in a timely manner and that all we would have done was moved the delay from the processing of the kits to the processing of the results from the kits. So what uh, we've done is uh, taken four positions from across the department and transferred them into the sex crimes unit to create a cold case sex crimes unit. These four detectives will focus on handling the results that we are now beginning to get back from these labs that we've sent these kits to. In some instances there may be follow-up uh, on the cases in which we collected this kit for if there's a profile. But there also may be the possibility that although there's nothing else we can do with the case for which we collected the evidence from in that kit, if we've now identified an offender and we've loaded their profile into the CODIS system, that may link to other crimes that had been unsolved to this point because we did not know who the offender was. So there's a lot of things that we are uh, hoping to see as we start processing this evidence, as we start loading this data into CODIS. But again, what we realized is to expect this work to be able to be handled by a unit that was already suffering from you know, a pretty high caseload, we realized that it was not gonna get handled in the, in the timely manner that we wanted to, so it was important to go ahead and create this unit. So these four positions were taken from elsewhere in the department. Um, you know, we're, not, we're in a position where we had to find places to pull from, and, and not ideal, but we pulled a couple of positions away from our park enforcement unit, and then we pulled a couple away from our investigative units, our property crimes unit, and our organized crime unit. Again, we felt like with the challenges that we have right now, with the backlog that we have of cases that we're trying to work, and again, with trying to let our survivors know that we care about them, we care about what has happened to them, and that we want to work towards closure of their cases, that it was important at this time to go ahead and create this unit. Uh, we're starting this unit with four detectives, and we will monitor the work of this unit to determine if four is appropriate, if four is allowing us to keep up with the returns as they come in in a manner in which we believe is, is, uh, is fit, and if not, we'll make adjustments as, that, uh, as we move forward. But again, we wanted to get out and let the community know that this is a step we've now taken because the work we've done to this point to get these contracts in place, to get these kits submitted to labs for processing, we're now starting to get the results and we just were not organized in a way that these results would have been handled in a timely manner given the staffing issues that we've had. So we prioritized this and we've transferred additional detectives into that unit so that we can address it in an appropriate manner. So um, with that, I'll open it up if there are any questions um, from... Uh, How many uh, uh, cases are, are still backlogged or left in the back? The backlog is just over 3,000. It's just, it's just under 3,100 cases that we had. And so those are the cases that we're trying to clear right now. We've sent almost 1,500 of those out to the labs already, and those are the cases that are starting to come back now. 
And the 1500 that you sent out, how far back, what's the time span on that? How far back do they go? What are the most recent ones? So the, to be considered a, a eligible for the Danny Grant, and the Danny Grant is the grant that we received from the District Attorney of New York to process our backlogged cases, to be eligible for that, a case has to be at least a year old. The backlog of cases that we have here at APD dates back to the early 90s. I believe the earliest one may be from 1991. And again, these cases, many of them will be cases where we may have actually had uh, a suspect who was known to the victim, we may have had a confession, we may have had witnesses, and therefore the case may have been prosecuted. And that kit was never processed for DNA because it was not needed for prosecution at the time. What we now realize is although the kit may not have been needed for prosecution of that crime, by identifying the profile that's within that kit and loading it into CODIS, we may have someone that has reoffended since that time and was unknown to that victim, and we may actually have the evidence that would link those two cases. So again, the importance here is, is on a couple of fronts. Number one, it's important that the victims know we're doing everything we can in their cases, um, getting this evidence processed. But then also it's important that we do this because we may link these to some cases where the uh, suspect was unknown but was known in this case. We have a lot of cases, unfortunately, where the survivor does not want to see us move forward with prosecution. They do not want to cooperate with the prosecution. Um, and in those cases, we may not have tested that kid at that time because it was not a prosecutable case because the victim, the survivor, did not want to see a prosecution. We're processing those now, though, because the importance, like I just said, we may develop a profile, a DNA profile that we loaded into CODIS may link to other cases. Is, is, this unit, is this unit permanent or is it just to deal with this backlog? This unit uh, may end up being permanent. I think to clear up the backlog, it is still going to take us quite a while. And uh, with the caseload still growing, the city still growing, I think that there will continue to be a need for these four positions. So uh, as it stands right now, I do not see an end date for this unit. Do you know if the, um, the uh, DNA, the rape kits for, and I'm not sure how many there were of the, the Northwest Austin rapist, if those have been in the labs that have gone? I'm not sure of what specific cases have gone for the labs. I just know we've got almost 1,500 of them, but I've not looked at the list of which cases have gone and which have not. So, you know, some of these you're saying date back to the 90s. Um, you know, for people who ask, well, will the, you know, will it still be able to get good results from that? Because it is, you know, a little bit longer. I don't know how long um, DNA less or you know and all of that so just kind of explain that aspect yeah. although some of these kits have been on the shelf for 20 years uh, if properly stored and maintained I do believe that there is a, a strong likelihood that if there was enough evidence present when the sample was collected 20 years ago that we will be able to obtain a DNA profile obviously things can degrade over the years um, and again, depending upon storage conditions. And then of course, most importantly, was the sample collected 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a strong enough sample to yield a result? Uh, we won't know until we start obviously getting all of the results back and working through them. But the only way we'll know for sure is if we process every case and that's what we're committed to doing. You mentioned uh, that some victims didn't want to prosecute at the time. Have you heard from victims who were maybe more interested in, in prosecuting, uh, but just weren't able to get there? So we will, part of this will be an outreach to uh, each survivor um, of these sexual assaults. That may be a difficult process. Some of these cases, again, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, people have moved. Um, and so we will work diligently though to make contact with the survivors to let them know that we have actually processed their kit. And, and then of course, if there were findings in the kit that maybe we had someone who was not looking to move for a prosecution when they were, uh, when they were victimized and is in a different place in their life right now and wants to, then those will be the things that we'll look at compared to the statute of limitations and all. So there is a lot that will go into that. Any idea what a dollar amount would be on, on you know, basically not just the retesting, but then uh, the, the cost of the, the cold case unit, uh, reaching out to victims, any idea what the dollar amount on that would be at this point? So really can't put a dollar amount to, these are detectives that are already within our budget. They're already funded within our budget. So the easiest answer is it's the cost of four detectives because we're paying their salary. Um, but again, it's just something that we feel is very important to do at this time and to dedicate the resources towards this effort. Um, I'm, I'm 
happy that we're at the point now to where we're finally getting results. This was a position we should not have been in in the first place, but for the reasons we've already explained, we are here. But we are taking every step possible to advance this and to bring these cases to closure. Last Safe question. Alliance, Safe Alliance was a little bit concerned about hearing yesterday from another outlet about the reassignment, and you, you've confirmed to us all now, the reassignment of a, of, of a detective from organized crime over to this. Is that, are those positions going to be backfilled at all, or is that up to future budget discussions, or I guess play by ear? I guess so, how, you, were, how, you were very, can you describe kind of how carefully you were picking out the people that you would assign to the team? Sure. We need detectives across the department. That's that we, we've asked for them over the years. And of course, you know, we've got uh, we've got needs across the city. So we get what we get. And where we come up, we do an analysis like this is what units are staffed to the best level to be able that we can actually pull a detective away. There's not any unit in the department where we can pull someone away without having an impact. Uh, we pulled away from the organized crime unit and, uh, you know, organized crime has a many functions. I believe it might have been reported that uh, human trafficking was involved in that. That is one of the areas that organized crime focuses on. They also do gang enforcement, they do drug enforcement, they do all kinds of different types of investigations. And so they're a large enough unit that I believe they will be able to absorb the loss and still maintain their operations. But that is something that we will pay attention to as we continue to move forward with this program and that we will include in future budget discussions as far as an additional need uh, to staff the department. All right, one more, one more question, just about the Rainy Street. Um, uh, there was a press release from APD about a sexual assault on Rainy Street. Can you speak to security on Rainy Street? Obviously a lot of people are there. What about lighting? Will there be extra patrols um, after that incident? Sure. So we are obviously looking for a suspect. We've put out a description of this individual. This is one of those, you know, this doesn't happen often in Austin where we have a stranger uh, assault like this. And so we are definitely asking the community's help, come forward if you know who the suspect is. If you think you can identify them, we need the information. Uh, we have pushed this out to all of our officers. The officers will be on alert looking for this person. And of course, we will definitely pay attention to the rainy area and make sure that we have additional resources down there. But just because the initial assault happened, that doesn't mean that if there were to be another one, that it would be in the same location. So this is just another opportunity also to make sure that we remind the community as well to always be aware of your surroundings. Um, always be aware of where you're at. Um, you know, we see folks that are very focused on, you know, their, their cell phones or listening to the music, and this is not at all to indicate that's what happened here, but it would be foolish of us not to at least address things that people can do just to ensure personal safety across the board, not just from an offense like this, but just general safety. So yes, we are on alert based on what has happened here. The description has been put out. Officers are looking for this individual. And again, we ask for the community to come forward if you know anything that will help us solve this case. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.